start with uh, a case that demonstrates some of the important issues. If you take a deeper look at uh, cost allocations, and this is a healthcare case, and uh, the reasons I, reason I chose healthcare because healthcare services are becoming increasingly more important in the economy and uh, even more importantly because we are talking about services. And I'd like to talk in this course more about services. And the reason uh, is that I'd like to emphasize that what we say in cost accounting and management accounting applies for services as well as products. Because if you uh, take a historic view of things historically, cost accounting uh, started in manufacturing and was focused on manufacturing. But at that time, early in the 20th century, the largest sector in the economy was manufacturing. Well, now, uh, thank you. Well, now uh, most advanced economies, or all advanced economies actually, uh, feature service sectors that are much larger than manufacturing uh, uh, sectors and that account for around 70% of advanced economies. So service sector is much larger than the manufacturing sector, and if we all we had to say in this course was only true for manufacturing that wouldn't be as important. But fortunately, that's not the case. So almost 95% uh, of what we say is truly applicable to services as well. So it's good to have examples where we work out services. Actually, uh, the only important difference uh, between in features between manufacturing and services is what? In other words, if you look, uh, if you compare producing goods for uh, customers or rendering services to customers, both goods, manufactured goods and services convey uh, benefits to customers. Uh, if there is any essential difference, what is it? Where, what uh, feature would you center on? Well, think about inventories, right? Uh, the biggest difference is between manufacturing and services is that uh, Services are not inventoriable. You just cannot inventory services. You render them, you render them, you can't just uh, uh, produce them, put them into inventory for future sale. So that's the big difference. So when we talk about management of inventories and treatment of inventories, obviously we refer to manufacturing. But other than that, Everything we say in this course is equally applicable to services. Okay, let's uh, get to this case. Uh, the central unit of a non-for-profit hospital, YZ, acquires and operates a specialized X-ray equipment it, oper it is operated by, cent by the central unit, and it's shared by the patients of department A and B. So you have a typical situation here where departments A and B are too small to each have a dedicated x-ray machine, and the x-ray machine, it's sophisticated x-rays that is, uh, is very expensive, so it's economically more cost efficient for there to be one machine operating by a central unit where the patients of A and B share 
the use of that machine. Department A budgets the use of, and I apologize here, there's a typo, uh, omit a zero for a number of figures. So Department A budgets a use of 60, not 600, 60 x-rays per month, and Department B budgets a use of 40, not 400, 40 x-rays per month. So these are budgeted or planned figures. And on the basis of these estimated usage or usage estimates, uh, the monthly budgeted fixed cost of operating the equipment is $100,000 per month. So in this uh, x-ray equipment, we are talking about uh, indirect fixed costs. Actually, they are the cost of operating, installing and operating a certain capacity, the capacity to provide x-ray services for the patients of department A and B. So on the basis of estimated usage of uh, department A, 60 x-rays per month, department B, 40 x-rays per month, uh, the central unit plans to lease an x-ray machine and the planned lease per month of operating it is $100,000. Now, the main question here with those fixed indirect costs is obviously the allocation question. How are these costs of the x-ray going to be allocated to Department A and Department B, whose patients use the x-ray machines? And remember, the allocation affects a lot of people here. The costs are allocated to the departments. The departments bill the customers, the patients who use the x-ray machines. And if you know hospital billing, hopefully not from your personal experience, but if you know hospital billing, you know that you're billed, there's item billing. So if you get x-rays, you're billed for the x-rays. So the patients eventually get the bills and uh, there is usually even a further step where the patients, most of them are hopefully insured, so they submit the bills to their respective insurers, and the insurers get the bills to reimburse the patients for the x-rays. So you could see the flow. And the challenge here is how to allocate those, the costs of those x-rays. So the story goes further by saying that the top management of Hospital YZ aims at putting in place a cost allocation system that would accomplish the following objectives. So they set objectives for the cost allocation. And uh, first objective, they want to cost the x-rays accurately to justify the billing of the patients and of departments A and B. So that's obvious. You want to do to allocate so you cost the x-rays as accurately as you can. And one of the main purposes is billing charging the departments and for the departments then on this basis to bill uh, the patients for the x-ray services. Now, a second objective is performance control and performance evaluation to evaluate the cost performance of the central unit 
and of departments A and B effectively and fairly. Well, this is a non-for-profit hospital, but still, hospital need to do performance control and performance evaluation on how well they perform quality-wise and also how well they perform cost-wise. So uh, the cost allocation has to provide the basis for controlling and evaluating the performance of the central unit and of departments A and B. A third very important function of cost allocation is to provide proper incentives. So that's reflected in the third objective give the central unit and departments A and B proper incentives to operate in a manner that is congruent with the objectives of hospital YZ. And what are these main objectives? To utilize the equipment in a cost-efficient manner, to provide patients with timely X-ray services, and to build them for these services in a transparent and fair manner. So a good allocation system would provide the actors here, which are the central unit and departments A and B, with incentives to work toward these objectives. And the fourth objective has to do because a lot of the allocation, the op, the, a lot of the installation of this capacity and the operation of this capacity to provide x-ray machines, x-ray services, the x-ray machine to provide x-ray services, a lot of the installation and the operation of this capacity has to do with how you predict the needs, what kind of needs you predict, in this case, for your patients to have x-rays. And the prediction of those needs is based on budgets or estimates, estimates that uh, are formalized in budgets as to future needs. You want to elicit from Department A and B accurate predictions on what are their, or what will be their x-ray needs. You don't want people to play games with budgets. Uh, you want to get, to give them the incentive to elicit from them the most accurate figures that you can. So those are basically the objectives that are set by the hospital, which is typical of the objectives that most organizations would like to achieve in cost allocations. Now in October, uh, the hospital allocated, in October the hospital operated already an allocation system, which we'll call the existing allocation system. And the existing allocation system allocated actual cost on the basis of actual usage. So the features of that system is that it allocated actual costs, the emphasis is on actual, based on actual usage. Now the actual cost of operating for the months of October turned out to be recorded as the operation was carried out, was recorded at $124,000. So notice the plan was $100,000 a month, 
but the actual costs for October turned out to be $124,000 a month by the central unit, so there were cost overruns of $24,000. The actual usage of the X-ray machine for October was 40, we omit the zero again, 40 X-rays for Department A and 40 X-rays for Department B. So notice Department A budgeted or estimated or planned for 60 X-rays, but it used only 40. So it over budgeted or its usage came under budget, 40 actual versus 60 budgeted. On the other hand, Department B happened to be right on budget. Department B budgeted 40 x-rays and actually used 40 x-rays. Now, since the existing system allocates on the basis of actual cost and actual usage. So the actual cost was $124,000 of operating the X-ray machine. And this was allocated 40 and 40, so half and half. So half of $124,000, $62,000 went to A and $62,000 went to B. So A was charged $62,000 for x-ray. B was charged $62,000 for the x-ray usage. And on the basis of these charges, they billed the customers. So that's how the allocation system operated. Also, uh, these are the fixed costs. These are the fixed indirect costs of uh, providing the x-rays, but there were also variable indirect costs. And the variable indirect costs were the cost of the radiologist, because remember, those x-rays need to be read by specialists. And in this story, these are sophisticated x-rays, so they need very sophisticated specialists, specialist radiologists who are specialists. And uh, the, so it says that the x-ray results are read and interpreted by radiologists. The S is missing, should be radiologists. The radiology department budgets or charges or allocates plans the plan are $1,000 per x-ray to charge the departments. In actuality, it ends up compensating radiologists at a higher than budgeted level. And as a result, it charges A and B $1,200 per x-ray instead of the 1,000 that were planned, so their cost overruns of $200 per x-ray. So that's what was going on in October under the existing allocation system. So by the end of October, uh, the people involved with this allocation, uh, the heads of the hospital of the central unit and the heads of department A and B, and we forgot here the head of the radiology department is forgotten here, so it should be here too. And the patient's ombudsman, who is the person representing patient's interests in the hospital, meet to evaluate the current allocation methods. This five should be really the sixth party with the head of radiology. The six parties convened to discuss negotiate and reach consensus over the following issues. So what they wanted to decide is, first of all, does the current allocation system meet the above objectives, the objectives we enunci uh, they enunciated, in ways that this system can be preserved? 
If not, if the objectives are not met, what system that best meets the above objectives can be negotiated among the parties involved? And finally, if we have a new system, could the preferred new allocation method you choose lead to any undesirable behavioral incentives? If so, what additional remedies would you propose? So basically, uh, the task of this committee is to decide on those issues. And you can visualize yourself as being the member of the committee. Visualize yourself as representing either the departments or the radiology or central unit or the head of the hospital or whoever you'd like to represent. But basically, the first issue is is the current system that allocates actual costs on the basis of actual usage, is it a good cost allocation system? In terms, what do you mean good? In terms of achieving the objectives. So any thoughts about that? How good or how problematic is it? Yes, let's get back to the objectives. You're right. We should refresh our mind about the objectives. Cost, uh, cost so accurately to justify the billing of the patients of department A and B. Cost accurately. Evaluate, basis for evaluating cost performance of the central units, department A and B, and radiology too. Give the proper incentives and elicit accurate predictions of future needs. So does the actual system as of October achieve these objectives? Well, let's start with the machines, with the x-ray machine. The actual cost was $124,000. And the $124,000 of actual cost was allocated, is allocated to departments A and B, who on the basis of this allocation build their customers who took the ac those patients of them, of these departments, who took the x-ray services. So if you're the head of A or the head of B, do you have any problem with that? Do you have any reason to be upset? Are you concerned that your patients or their health insurance insurers have the reason to be upset. Well, notice you're allocating 124,000, but uh, what was the planning? The planning was 100,000, right? So actually, there were cost overruns in, by the central unit in running the machine of 24,000, the difference between 124,000 and 100,000. So A and B are allocated $124,000 of x-ray costs for the months of October. They can say, if I were one of them, well, I would say, well, we planned on being charged $100,000, both of them can say, we were planned on being charged $100,000, but we're now charged $124,000 because uh, central unit had cost overruns. Well, we didn't have cost overruns. They had cost overruns. Well, if they had cost overruns of $24,000, 
why should we and our patients be charged for the cost overruns? We're not responsible for them. Our patients are not responsible for them. can give you a scenario where the patients and the insurers may be upset. Maybe it is uh, this x-ray machine is uh, innovative. It's a new type of x-ray, which is unconventional, so it uh, represents new treatment. Uh, whenever it's a new or experimental treatment, You know how it works with most insurances. If you plan to take a new and experimental treatment, uh, you usually have to get a pre-authorization from your health insurer that they will authorize you to take it in the sense that they will pay for it, that they will reimburse it. They may or may not, depending on what their experts think about the system, and they may say they won't, and you may negotiate with them. But certainly, they, if they need to preauthorize, they would want to know what the costs are. Now, the estimated costs because they're doing it ahead of time. The estimated costs were $100,000 for how many x-rays? 40 plus 60, uh, 60 by A and 40 by B, not 600 because we took a zero out. 60 by A and 40 by B were estimated to 100. The estimated costs were 100,000, so in the pre-authorization process, the estimate was 100,000 divided by 100 x-ray, or $1,000 each per x-ray, right? Well now, what, is the, what does the cost turn out to be? It's 124,000 divided by how many x-rays? Not by 100, but by 80, right? 40 and 40. So the costs are higher. One of the reasons that the costs are higher per x-ray, we can go to the cost per x-ray in terms of how they're calculated. That's easy. Uh, 124,000 divided by 80. Now, instead of um, 1,000 costs per x-ray, 50% more, 1,550 costs, 1,550 1, rather than 1,000. One of the reasons, one of the reasons is the overruns, $124,000 allocated rather than 100,000. So the patients may say, or their insurers may say, and A and B may say, well, these are overruns of central unit. Why are, should we be held responsible? Why should we carry those costs? Furthermore, you can argue in terms of incentives, if you allow as a matter of course, as a procedure, if you allow the central unit to pass on to the patients and the customers any cost overruns, where is the incentive for them to economize, right? If you're told that you can pass on the cost overruns to another department and to the customers, right? Why do you have any strong incentive to economize? Human nature being as it is, anytime we said, oh, whatever you, 
whatever, whenever you exceed your cost, you can pass it on to somebody else, right? Uh, we're not going to have uh, that strong an incentive to be efficient in our cost management. So the incentives are lacking. Furthermore, if you look in the meeting at the department heads, B, B, if you're the head of department B, you're even more upset than if you're the head of department A. Because if you're the head of department B, you said, look, I came right on target in terms of my utilization forecasts. I said I will need 40 x-rays. I budgeted 40 x-rays and I used 40 x-rays. And I plan to be allocated on the basis of dividing the cost by 100 x-rays. And that would be the case had, B, had A been also accurate and on budget. So A would have used 60 x-rays in Calculating the cost per x-ray, the cost would have divided by 100 rather than by 80. So now, I am getting charged, my patients are getting charged a higher charge per x-ray, not only because the central unit overran its cost, but also because what? Because A was inaccurate. A used only 40 x-rays rather than using 60. But I shouldn't be responsible, my patients, I and my patients shouldn't be responsible for what A does. You know, I don't know why A was not accurate in his estimates. Maybe there was a good reason, maybe not. But why should I bear the consequences? So that's an interesting, that's also an interesting question, a difficult question. The same question, uh, some of the same questions can be asked about uh, radiology. In radiology, it's not a question of usage because it's not a fixed cost, it's a variable cost, but the variable cost, uh, the departments are charged in base of 1,200, 1200 per x-ray rather than the estimated 1,000. So again, it's a question of the radiology department being allowed to pass on its cost overruns at will. Of course, the head of the hospital may ask, okay, so what is the alternative? We have to cover our costs. But the question is, who is responsible? In passing on the cost this way, the system is not geared to, the system is not geared to evaluate the performance of the different units. The ombudsman who is who represents the patients can say to the head of the hospital, I understand that you have to cover your costs. You're a nonprofit organization, not for profit, you have to cover your costs. But where is your incentive to economize? If everybody can pass on the costs, the hospital can be careless about its costs and costs can rise and rise and will be passed on to the patients. The patients are entitled, the patients and their insurers are entitled to have a system, an allocation system, which will provide incentives for the hospital and the units within the hospital to economize in cost because otherwise everybody's going to be careless about cost. The cost of health care will go up. People will say, well, the health providers, such as the hospital, will say, well, 
they go up, we'll pass them on to the patients, and the patients will pass them on to the insurers, and, uh, and that's that. Meantime, the percentage of uh, the GDP that goes to healthcare increases, Medicare becomes insolvent, and God knows what. And the uh, insurers increase their premiums. So here you can see you can see the problems there. So I think that if you just review the discussion that may go on, you can see that with all of this host of problems, it is fair if the uh, if the committee is fair-minded, they would come to the conclusion that the existing system is not a very good system in achieving the objectives. Actually, it does not achieve the objectives. So we're in the existing allocation system, we are not having a very good system. So then the question is, what is the alternative? So the question is always, what is the alternative? Or Maybe this system isn't good, but do we have a better system? So any thoughts about that? Do we have a better system? That's here. That's the charge number two to the committee. <clears throat> Anybody would want to conceive about a better allocation system? Well, actually, look, there are not too many choices. This allocation system is based on actuals, right? Well, allocation system has to be based on some numbers. We have a set of actual numbers, costs and usage. If you don't want to base it on actuals, what are you going to base it on? So basically, what other set of numbers do you have? Well, the other set of numbers that you have is budgeted numbers. So the thought may come to you by a process of elimination. Well, maybe the alternative, if there is an alternative, the alternative is to use, to do the allocation using budgeted numbers. Now let's see what happens if we do the allocation using budgeted numbers. First of all, look at the mechanics. Well, we are going to allocate $100,000, the budgeted cost, not the actual cost. So we are going to allocate $100,000 of running the machine, the budgeted cost to the departments. And we are going to allocate it by budgeted usage. So A used only 40, but he budgeted for 60. So he will be allocated according to what A budgeted. B budgeted for 40, and he's going to be allocated by 40. The $24,000 is going not to be allocated, but it's going to remain as a deficit. Because it's not going to be reimbursed, because if it's not allocated to A and B, then A and B will not bill the customers. A and B will not bill the customers for the extra $24,000, because they would be allocated only $100,000. So, the hospital will have to find a way. So the central unit will have to explain the cost overruns, and the hospital will have to find a way to absorb those costs because they're not going to be reimbursed by the patients. But so that's the way to do it if we do it the budgeted way. I'm not saying that's the way to do it, but that's the way to do it if we allocate the budgeted way. What are the advantages? The advantages are that 
and the radiology, excuse me, the radiology will also be cost of the radi uh, of reading uh, reading the X-rays is going to be allocated at budgeted cost of one thousand, not of twelve hundred. With the radiology department stuck with the two hundred dollars cost overruns to be explained, and the hospital to absorb them because, again, they're not going to be reimbursed by the patients. Well, the advantage of this system of allocating the cost on a budgeted basis is that, first of all, there is no incentive, there's incentive to economize because, for example, if the central unit knows that it's not going to be able to allocate more than the budgeted cost, that it will be stuck with the overruns, then it has an incentive to manage its costs more efficiently. They'll be told you just cannot pass on your overruns. They remain with you. And the patients will be billed as expected. They will not be passed on any cost overruns. And in terms of usage, Department B will not suffer extra allocations per X-ray because A misestimated its X-ray use because the allocation is going to be done on the basis of 100 x-rays rather than 80 x-rays. So these are the advantages. Of course, the CFO or the controller, it's not CFO, really usually the controller. The controller of the hospital may say, well, that's all very good and fine, but we're going, but with this system, if we have cost overruns, 200 on reading each x-ray or $24,000 on the equipment per month, uh, we're going to be stuck with those overruns and they're going to become our deficits. So what is the hospital going to do? And the answer is the hospital, the answer maybe will be provided by the ombudsman or by somebody else saying, uh, well, it's not bad for the hospital to absorb the costs because that will give the whole hospital management of the hospital an incentive to know that if they overrun their costs, they are go they're not going to be able to pass it on to their patients so they will have to absorb it and they'll give them incentive and if they overrun, for example, if they overrun here and they will have to absorb the 24,000 in October, it will give them an incentive in future months to come under the 100,000 where they can repay or erase the deficit of overrunning in early months. So it could put uh, it could put a damper on the idea that costs can simply be passed on. So those are advantages of running uh, the allocation system based on uh, based on budgeted costs, but there's charge number three, which anticipates the idea that whatever system that they come up with, no, let's move here, uh, whatever system they're going to come up with is not going to be perfect. So the allocation according to budgets is obviously, you suspect that it's not a perfect system. There are no perfect systems in these world of cost allocations. So no system is a complete panacea, so there will be some 
disadvantages to the budgeted system. So let's think. The budgeted system, allocating according to budgeted figures rather than actual figures, rectified some of the problems with the actual allocation system, but it can create other problems. Let's see if we can recognize which problems it can be created when you base the allocation on budgets. Well, budgets, yes. Yeah, the budget usually, the way the budget is set usually in any organization, it's the process starts by the different units setting the budget. Then it has to be agreed by top management, right? But you go to the individual units and ask them first to estimate what their needs are going to be. Then you may authorize them or not, right? But uh, the budget starts as a grassroots process. And after the estimates come from the grassroots from the units, right? Well, you, you know, top manager is not going necessarily to allow the units anything that they want, right? So it's going to be a negotiation, right? But budget, but you're, you're coming to the right idea. Budgets are created by people, and people are people. They have their own objectives and their own interests. Now, if you are asked to come with budget estimates, if the units are asked to come with budget estimates, and you depend on the units because you don't know everything that is happening, so if you sit at the top, you cannot make, you don't have all the information. But what is the problem if you depend on the units? Yeah, the bu that's the point, that the budget figures can be manipulated. Yeah, it, you see, it doesn't, it, let's make it true. This, the budgets in organizations are not set completely by the units themselves. The units propose budgets or give information and suggest what their needs are going to be, and then it's decided by higher management, but based in part on numbers that come from the units. Why? Because when you sit up in top management, you don't know necessarily what the needs are. You have to be close to operations to know what the needs are. That doesn't mean that you're going to give people everything they want, but the input into the budget comes in large part from the grassroots by the units by the operating units and by the units that are budgeted. So your point is well taken that obviously budgeted f figures that come from people can be manipulated. And there is an incentive to manipulate budgets because you know that the resources that are going to be allocated to you will be based in part on what you budget and what you say your needs are. Not completely, but in part, they're going to be based on what you say your needs are. So when you estimate your needs, you're very much aware of the fact that these estimates would be an input for the allocation of the resources. So the question is, uh, do you have an incentive to be accurate? For example, if you are head of Department A and Department B, and you know that you'll be allocated by your estimated, by your budgeted usage, not your actual usage, that's the method that, that's the better method, to, so to speak, of that we discuss. And what do you want? You want to be charged less rather than more. Everybody wants to be charged less rather than more, right? So you want to be charged less by the, for the x-ray units rather than more. So what would you be tempted to do? 
to underestimate your usage, right? So there will be an incentive for the departments A and B to underestimate, for example, the usage of the X-ray and other things, too. But we're talking about this example now. So for example, A can set that instead of needing 60, he will need 30, and B will set instead of 40, 20. So all in all, they will need 30 plus 20, they'll need 50 x-rays per month. Now, if you take it seriously, if the management of the hospital takes it seriously, then it will set up the x-ray capacity based on 50 x-rays a month. Now, and then suppose they need 90 x-rays a month. So what happens? You, have a, you set a capacity on the basis of under estimated usage of 50, and now you have 90 actual demand for x-rays. So what happens? You have inadequate capacity. You have set inadequate capacity. And then, of course, patients who need x-rays will have to queue up and wait. And there may be long waiting times, which decreases the quality of your service. And in healthcare, it may also be dangerous. If these are require, if these are important X-rays, and you have to wait, you may uh, get the right the right diagnosis too late. So that's one example. Uh, the central unit. What will be the incentive of the central unit if it knows that it budgeted? Remember. It uh, budgeted 100,000. It budgeted 100,000, and it actually spent 124,000. Well, it doesn't want to be in this position again of cost overruns. Well, one good way not to be in this position again is to try harder, either to be accurate in your predictions or to try to manage efficiently. But People are political, so what can they try to do? All of us, if you know that you will be able to pass on only your budgeted costs, so what are you be tempted to do? To budget higher, overestimate. You give yourself a cushion, right? So if things go wrong, or if you're not as efficient as you thought you would be, right? you're not going to get into those cost overruns. So you are uh, have an incentive to overestimate in this case. So you can see these are, we have new problems now. The system may be better, but we have new problems. The question is, with these type of problems, budget manipulations, uh, do we have any can we think of remedies? If we want the new system, could we think of allocating based on budgets? Uh, can we think of remedies? Well, we said that people have the incentive to manipulate the figures. Well, can we give them incentives not to manipulate the figure. It's the idea. In other words, we know now that they have incentives to. Yes. Well, that's another issue in budgeting that we're going to come to it, a separate issue, but an important one that many budgets uh, have a problem that if you if you submit a budget and you approve the budget of say four hundred thousand dollars and you don't spend it 
And suppose you couldn't spend it or you found a more efficient way, so you spend only 300,000, so 100,000 is taken away. And not only that, but next year they'll say, well, next year, if I review your budget, I'll say, well, you showed that you could do it at 300,000, so we're not going to budget you again at 400,000 because uh, you could do it at 300,000, right? So obviously these are problematic incentives, right? So what you have to do is to, if you manage to come under budget, uh, we have to reward you for that. We have to find a way to reward you for that. Now either we give you, either we let you spend the money in ways, in other creative ways, or we say, okay, you came under budget, uh, that is going to be reflected in a profit-making organization can be reflected in a bonus. So we'll give you a bonus each time that you come under budget, right? Or we, uh, we note it in your performance and we promote you faster. But there got to be specific incentives for that. And also, there should be an assurance that next year you're not going to be penalized for the fact that you're efficient and you're going to come and say, well, now that you were able to do with less, we'll give you less. But next year is going to be examined independently. But you're right. I mean, these are problems with budgets. So coming back to our situation here, the question is what we could do is, uh, again, give uh, managers here specific incentives to reward them for accurate budgeting. In other words, say accurate budgeting is another parameter in your performance and find a way to reward them for being accurate in their estimates as well and maybe penalize them if they're very inaccurate in their estimates. So there are ways to do it, but we have to be aware of the fact. Now, how we reward them and penalize them? It depends, either by bonuses or by uh, good or bad personal performance evaluations, which determine raises and determine career paths and so forth. But we have to find a way, if we want to go to the budgeted here, we have to find a way to reward people for not manipulating budgets and or to penalize them for manipulating budgets so as to take the incentive away. So you can see uh, the complexities uh, that arise with cost allocations and uh, why we have to be very careful that our cost allocations are accurate as much as they can be, that they give the proper incentives, that they provide a basis for good control and performance evaluations. Now, these are things that are easily said or set as objectives, but they are very often difficult to achieve. Okay, any questions on the healthcare before we move to the case of by services? No, the case of by services is the case. We'll move to the case. But if no questions, what I would like to do now is to move uh, to case number three, which is due tomorrow, no later than 10, and see if you have any questions on case number three. Uh, now, the first part of case three, uh, case three doesn't, doesn't have much work into it. Once you zero in correctly on the problem, shouldn't be much uh, work in answering the requirements. But let's just clarify it, and let's see if uh, you have any questions or you need any clarifications. Well, first part of the case, yes? 
Yes, but the reason I decided that we have to is because I looked at our schedule. Uh, we, uh, in order so we can cover the material, we need to dis uh, we need to discuss. Uh, I want to devote time, class time, to discuss this case uh, rather thoroughly. And the only time that we have to do it is on our meeting on Thursday. So uh, that caused me to take the case on Wednesday. But basically, it is not a laborious case. So let's see if we can uh, clarify anything that needs to be clarified in the case. Actually, the first part of the case has to do with uh, uh, allocation of uh, the cost of support services of support departments to operating departments. Now, any business of a respectable size even small size, has support functions and support departments in addition to operating departments. Now, the operating divisions or departments or operating units are those units that do the operations and provide the products or the services that the company sells. But in order for those operating departments to do their job, they have to be supported by other departments. And what we focus here in this case is on the how do you allocate the cost of the support departments to the operating divisions. So you have to envision here a two-stage process. In the first place, the support, the cost of the support departments are allocated to the operating divisions or units who use those support services. And then all the costs accumulated in the operating divisions, their own costs, plus the support costs that they're charged for using support services, all the costs together are then allocating to, allocated to products and services as a second stage. So we are dealing here with the first stage. <coughs> how, do, how do we allocate support costs? So in this example, we have two support departments, units, uh, the legal department, that provides legal services as support services and the human resources department that provide human resources support services of the corporation XXX. And uh, the legal and human resources department support the operations of Division A and Division B of the corporation. You're given that the total cost incurred by the legal department in supporting A and B are two million, and the total cost incurred by the human resources department in supporting A and B is ten million dollars. And uh, the legal department devotes 400 person hours, PH, to support Division A, 600 PH <coughs> to support Division B, and also, remember, legal supports also human resources. So another 100 PH to support human resources. Why does legal, which is a support division, supports human resources, which is another support division? Because human resources need legal services. For example, if they have, uh, if one of the tasks of human resources is to have uh, uh, recruitment recruitment functions. Uh, there are legal issues in how they recruit that they may very well need the advice of legal. 
so they'll need the support for legal, just one example. Now, the Human Resources Department devotes 1,000 pH to support Division A, 2,000 pH to support Division B, and 200 person hours to support legal because legal department needs also human resources services. It needs payroll. It needs uh, recruiting. It needs career pathing. So it needs human resources services. So you see the picture. The support departments in this case, human resources and legal support the operating divisions A and B, but they also exchange, so they provide services to A and B, but they also exchange services among themselves. Now, the corporation considers two methods to allocate the support costs of the legal department and human resources department to divisions A and B. First method is known as the direct allocation method. This method, this is a simple, direct allocation method is a quick and simple method. And why is it quick and simple? Because this method ignores the exchange of support services between legal department and human resources department. And it proceeds, this method proceeds to allocate all legal and human resource support costs directly to the operating divisions A and B, ignoring the interchange between legal and human resources. The second allocation method is known as the reciprocal allocation method. And this method in, alloc in, in this method, in allocating support costs to the operating departments, specifically explicitly incorporates reciprocal cost allocation for support services exchange between the legal and the human resources department. That's why it's called reciprocal because human resources and legal are reciprocal. They exchange services among each other. Now, the CFO of the corporation decides that the number of person hours devoted by each support department to serve the other units, and the person hours are given, will be used as the allocation base or as the cost driver. Now in the requirements, you're uh, required to consult your textbook that describes uh, the procedures of the direct allocation method and the reciprocal allocation method, and then answer the following requirements. Now, a number of things I want you to alert you to. Your textbook has actually three methods, the direct method, the step-down method, and the reciprocal allocation method. Now, we are not going to cover the step-down method because, as I'll try to convince you when we discuss the case, uh, and, and we discuss those methods, the step-down method doesn't make much sense. So there's no point to spend much time on it. So just ignore the step-down method and its description. So concentrate on the direct method and the reciprocal method. And what you're asked to do is to allocate support costs to the operating divisions using the direct and the reciprocal allocation methods. And then to decide which method would you recommend. The second requirement says if rather than using traditional costing, of using just one cost driver, could you design an how would you design an activity-based costing, ABC, for this type of allocation? And third, if you are the CFO, um, and as a CFO, if you allow for the operating and support units to negotiate their own transfer prices, 
which means their own allocations. You allow the heads of those units to negotiate their own allocations for the services they exchange or transfer among each other. How would you structure and regulate such a system? Okay, any questions about this part of the case or any clarifications that are needed? So once, uh, once you establish how you need to, crux is to establish how you use the direct method, which is very simple, to understand one or two essential points about the reciprocal method and then you're on your way. Because otherwise you have all the data to do it and the calculations are not laborious. Uh, the only thing that uh, the only thing that is a little bit uh, more laborious than simple calculations, allocation calculations, is that in the reciprocal allocation method, in this example, you have to set, uh, to account for the reciprocity between legal and human resources, you have to set uh, two uh, simultaneous equations linear equations with two unknowns and solve them. And that's easy and uh, there is an example in your text but basically solving two linear simultaneous equations with two unknowns is uh, just have to refresh your memory. It ba goes back to middle school algebra. So it's not a big deal. But the important thing is not the solution is easy with two equations and two unknowns. And I'm not going to hold you responsible in the exam for the math. Uh, the important thing is to understand how you set up, what is the logic of setting up those equations. Okay, uh, the second uh, part of the case is even much simpler. It has to do with uh, understanding the allocations of how, what are our alternatives in allocating byproducts or by service. So your service friend Anne and you attend the MBA. Well, I'm using a personal example and then we can digress to business examples because the principles are the same. Uh, your neighbor friend Anne and you attend, attend the MBA program in professional accounting. Both of you live a few blocks apart and have the same course schedule you offer her a daily ride in your car to school and offers to share in the cost. You incur, uh, you incur the following costs. So these are the costs, transportation costs of using a car. And the conversation between you runs as follows. And thanks for offering me a ride. It's great, but let me share in the cost. You, forget it. It's my pleasure. I go anyway. So there's no extra costs. And come on, I feel bad being a free rider. Let's just allocate the cost of the trips. You, believe me, Anne, even if I wanted to allocate, I wouldn't know how. And we are to be accountants. We should know how to fully allocate costs. You, in this case, we should allocate incrementally, not fully. And how are you, to, uh, now you're talking as an economist, not uh, like an economist, not like an accountant. You, uh, this is too complicated, and why don't you just buy me a coffee now and then? And please, I insist on sharing. You, I already did the incremental allocation, and your perfectly fair share is zero. But I want you to feel good, so there's the deal. If you can come up with a more reasonable cost allocation, I'll go along. So first question obviously is, can you come up with a more reasonable cost allocation? And secondly, that's a personal dis, uh, example, discuss the implication of the above costing business, uh, costing business by products or by services, whether if you, tr if you translate this to uh, a byproduct or by service produced in the business, whether the principles are the same or not.